Good afternoon and welcome to the Inspired PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to CEO Mark Dickinson. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Inspired PLC 2020 results. Presenting for you today, myself, Mark Dickinson, Chief Executive Officer, Paul Collar, Chief Financial Officer, and David Kopchot, Chief Commercial Officer. Um, I guess when we start these things, it's always good to remind people what the company um, does. So what does Inspired PLC do? We help corporate businesses deliver net zero and respond to climate change whilst controlling their costs. And we do that by meeting four key needs, cost, consumption, carbon, and compliance. The four C's, if you will. Now the business operates in three of the most topical and exciting macro themes available at the moment. The energy crisis, it's had an impact on everybody. And you remember that at our half one interims, we mentioned the uncertainty that the energy crisis was, was causing for not just businesses across the country, but also our own operations um, in, in terms of managing client, um, client needs and um, service levels, etc. And we're really pleased to say the group performed well, and David and Paul will walk you through um, how the divisions rose to those challenges and also took advantage of the opportunities. Going forward, the energy crisis has really brought utility spend to the top of the boardroom agenda and energy crisis defence, we believe, is going to be a major positive driver over the next few years. ESG, globally, one of the most exciting macro themes out there. There's a strong compliance driver. It's becoming a key requisite in order to attract investment. And it's also becoming revenue critical for organizations. When a business wants to win a new logo to its organization now or retain its existing customers, you generally need to provide ESG disclosures as part of that bidding process, whether it's a carbon action plan, a roadmap to net zero or a social value statement. That theme is really starting to drive behaviors and the inspired thesis were absolutely delighted with the bootstrap entry made into this area three years ago, going from naught to 2.6 million revenues in under three years. And um, Paul and David will really bring that to life for you in our divisional analysis. The third driver, net zero. Climate change is real, and ultimately businesses have their responsibility to play their part. What we're finding with that is it's increasing momentum for us to actually help clients intervene and reduce carbon emissions and reduce energy consumptions within the buildings and premises they operate from. This is um, a, a long-term driver, and we look, if you look at how that underpins optimization services, it's got the potential to continue driving growth for the next 25 years. So we operate in three really exciting macro themes. How do we do it? So in order to manage those four client needs of cost, consumption, carbon, and compliance, if you went back to 2018, you would have seen a business that didn't have its own proprietary software, didn't have an ESG services division, didn't have an optimization services division. Over the last five years, we've put together all the component parts to be able to be a full suite service provider. And we've done that whilst doubling EBITDA over that period. So now our four divisions work in a very symbiotic way. It starts with software. Software is our competitive advantage. A variety of software allows us to process unstructured data and provide our services to our clients. It's increasingly becoming a market leading platform. And we, that's evidenced by the fact we now have 60 other TPIs, some of our competitors utilizing that software and 200 direct um, companies. So our software provides a competitive advantage and is our technology enablement. That leads us into assurance and ESG, where our customers enter the business, our landing point. Some great macros in that area, non-discretionary recurring call to action, recurring revenues. We simplify complexity and provide subject matter expertise. And that helps us build C-suite relationships. 
And when we build those C-suite relationships, it earns us the opportunity to help our customers actually make a difference, to actually reduce carbon emissions and to actually um, reduce energy consumption. That gives us a drive to be able to significantly increase the client lifetime value um, of our portfolio. And um, Dave is going to walk you through how that business model works later on. From a finance perspective, really pleased with the year in what were really challenging times. Revenues up 31%, just a bit dire up 6%. We note the reduction in margin of 5%, but that's mainly due to mix. So ultimately each of our different divisions has a different EBITDA margin and that mix of a blend of services, Paul will walk you through how that's um, evolved. Um, really proud of cash generation from operations and we'll bring that to life for you. And Paul will show how that flows through to PBT and EPS. So we ask um, Paul and David now to walk you through the divisional performance. Okay, thanks, Mark. So in terms of the divisional performance, assurance services, this is the kind of backbone uh, and starting point of, uh, of Inspired. It's at the forefront of cost management. So whether it's energy or water, we're managing um, customers' costs or clients' costs. Uh, and that's in a background where some clients have seen energy prices soar by up to 500%. So it's become a boardroom agenda item. It's absolutely business critical. It has been a fight for survival in, in some instances. So the importance of having professionals in your corner working on this for you has never been greater. Same with the complexity. The energy bill relief scheme was a welcome intervention, but added yet more complexity to an already complex market. So the need for professional support uh, has never been greater. In terms of the performance, Revenues were in line with expectations, as was cash generation from this uh, side. Um, we have seen some increase in customer churn. To put that in perspective, we would normally quote around 85% retention rates. That's dropped slightly down to around 80. Um, but that's more than offset by a, a record year for new business. As the, some of the names that are coming in there, Aldi, Arnold Park, et cetera, Really pleased to welcome them in as customers. There has been some increase in overheads to deliver the service. As we said, it's become an important topic to customers and they've contacted us more often. They've done shorter term contracts that's led to a more um, admin work to be able to, to keep up, which had a, has added some additional OPEX to deliver. So, Paul, in terms of the financial? Yeah, thanks, Dave. So, as Dave said, additional churn impacted the top line which we notified the market of at the interim stage. So we saw a 1% increase in revenue in the division. Um, in terms of the additional cost, again, reflected in the change in margins, the reduction in margin. And that cost is to ensure that we sustain our level of service, which we believe to be market leading. And, and in doing so, enabling us to develop that client lifetime value that Dave referred to. Okay, thanks, Paul. In terms of ESG services now, this is no longer the I ought to, I should do uh, type of business. This is absolutely business and revenue critical. Whenever we as a business are quoting for a new piece of, of work that we want to win, or indeed often retaining clients, we get the RFI and we have to fill in various sections that will include things like the Carbon Action Programme, a roadmap to net zero, a social value statement, all of these things just to get to the start line. If you don't have them and have them in good order, you're not even at the races to win the new business. So it is revenue critical. It's investor critical. If you want to attract the new investment, you've got to be able to articulate your position on these ESG matters. So from a standing start, a bootstrap entry, to 2.6 million in under three years with a compound annual growth rate of 129 percent it's testament to our assertion that we have a market leading product at a market leading price point we're the only provider of this bottom-up technology enabled service that is completely framework agnostic it can be translated into any taxonomy that's required 
testimony some of the customers there that have taken this service uh, from us at this time. Paul? Yeah, so as Dave said, really pleasing CAGA revenue growth there from an organic entry point in 2020. But importantly, you'll note that we've grown 167% in the last 12 months, which shows an acceleration, um, which is particularly pleasing noting that when we, this time last year, we noted the market that had improved concept in 2020 and 21, we we're going to increase the investment in this area to further accelerate. And then furthermore, when we got to interim stage, we upgraded the expectations for this division because uh, it was performing at the higher end of management expectations. I'm pleased to report that the division performed in line with that upgraded expectation for the year. Thank you. Okay, optimization services, whether it's cost from the assurance side or it's carbon from the ESG side, the drivers to actually do something to reduce emissions, reduce consumption, reduce costs are there. Again, it's a board level agenda item and the pressure to do something and to, to act on this is absolutely growing. We're doing this from a position of strength, from almost within a business's organization, having gained trust on the assurance or ESG side, we become the strategic advisor for these optimization services. Strong performance, revenue up 64% in the year, all of which is organic. And there's resilient demand, whether it is from cost or carbon, that those drivers will continue way out into the future, even if prices were to collapse, but perhaps they're not yet. But even if they were, the drive for carbon is a 25 year drive and therefore will absolutely be there driving services into that optimization division. So from the emergence of COVID in 2020, where there was significant disruption to this division, the division has generated CAGA revenue growth of 85%, and 64% in the current year, and pleasingly um, contributing materially to cash generation of the group, hence the, the, the group level cash performance, doubling EBITDA in the period, and tip, ticking up adjusted EBITDA margin, partly through a reduction you may recall last year because the division wasn't running at full capacity for the full 12 months because of the levels of disruption in the early part of 2021 as the restrictions were lifted from a COVID perspective. Thanks, Paul. And obviously by no means least the software services division. This is the business that underpins all of our actions in those other three divisions. It's market leading and the increasingly recognized and attested to by the fact that we're selling this to 60 third party intermediaries, our competitors. We've also sold it direct to 200 clients using the platform. It is market leading. TPIs have always been uh, laggards in terms of, of, of technology, but increasing complexity means that spreadsheets and self build systems are just no longer suitable and there is an increasing demand for this platform uh, solution that we are, we've invested in. So again, uh, a solid performance in this area. Customers such as NHS Property Services, Peabody, Laser, taking our services directly from uh, software, demonstrating its value, and more good stuff to come. There are several modules expected to release in 2023 that will give us further upside potential in this area. Thank you, Dave. So um, from CAGA revenue growth since 2020 of 9%, a slight reduction in the period at 5%, but just the EBITDA remaining broadly stable. EBITDA margin slightly reduced as a result of uh, the acquired businesses in the period yet to be integrated into the wider group. So having run through the segmentals, um, if we were just reflecting from a group perspective on how the group has performed since 2019, noting that we've only segmentally reported in the structure we've just ran through since 2020. So you'll note a 27% increase in revenue across that period. As the pie charts demonstrate on the right-hand side, we've seen that change in mix. So the assurance business, previously the largest contributor to the group in 21, now in 22, the optimization services division is the largest contributor to the group. 
which has led to the reduction in margin and therefore a CAGA EBITDA growth of 8%. That's reflecting the CAGA PBT growth of 3%, noting that the amortization of some of the expenditure we've put and capital expenditure into our platform uh, over the last three to four years has started to flow through into amortization and plus an increase in interest costs as a result of the higher levels of net debt. What does that mean from an EPS perspective? So the fact that despite the fact e earnings have increased across that period, you see a 9% reduction in EPS. And that's driven by in 2020, you'll recall the significant equity raise, which ensured we strengthened the balance sheet in times of material um, uncertainty, but also allowed us to continue with our strategy in terms of M&A in acquiring the strategically important Ignite acquisition and then subsequently the business-wise acquisition in early 2021. In terms of cash flow performance, as March touched on, really pleased the cash flow performance in the period. That was coming off the back of an abnormal cash flow period in 2021, where we saw that nine, per, 9 million increase in receivables as we emerged from COVID, from a period where at the end of 2020, we'd had a really low rundown trade receivables position as the, the group was back into, or the optimization services division was back into a position where all the WIP had been billed and all the invoice cash had been collected. And this year, we've seen a 100% cash conversion performance across the group, which is particularly pleasing. And we're able to guide the market as we continue to focus on the working capital cycle of the optimization division to an expectation of 80 to 90% cash generation in 23 and beyond. You'll note there the contingent consideration payments in the period. So this is performance related payments in the form of contingent consideration for those acquisitions. And we'll come on to the way which we structured acquisitions um, and why we structure acquisitions the way we do in a couple of slides time. Um, also in the period, a reduction in the spending capital expenditure. We noted some exceptional stuff that we in, in 2021 that wouldn't be repeatable, hence the reduction there. Um, and also a tick up in interest costs in the period as well, due to the high levels of net debt through the period and an increase in interest costs. From a balance sheet perspective, so net debt at the period increased by 4.3 million. So that strong cash generation from operations in terms of free cash flow, um, we, we allowed us to fund the performance related contingent consideration payments in the period. Um, net debt expectation for the end of this year. So broadly remaining flat from a leverage perspective. So 1.77 times at December 22. 1.74 times at December 23, um, noting that those performance related payments for those acquisitions we expect will be circa 13 million in 2023, 2.6 of which will be um, payable in shares and offsetting the free cash flow of the group in that period. So in terms of M&A, noting that the performance related payments attached to M&A have been a notable number within both the PL and the cash flow in this period. We thought it was worthwhile reminding people of our acquisition principles and how that translates into performance related structures. So we structure transactions determined by the specific acquisition thesis for that deal. So you've got revenue synergy transactions, cost synergy transactions, and capability enhancement, and we'll structure deals accordingly to maximize those opportunities. We structure transactions to incentivize vendors to succeed through performance related structures so in the form of contingent consideration. We'll object that transactions are earnings enhancing within 24 months of completion. So what do performance related payments allow us uh, to achieve? So we only pay for EBITDA once delivered. So we won't pay for forecast EBITDA. And in doing so that allows those acquisitions to contribute to cash of the group in the period and where possible, be in part self-funding. It allows us, importantly, again, to remain acquisitive through times of volatility. And that was clearly apparent in 2020 and 2021, which have allowed us to complete those strategically important acquisitions and position the business really well to deliver that doubling of EBITDA organically over the next five years. It allows us to incentivize vendors to firstly transact and then subsequently deliver the acquisition thesis as set out above, and also support the wider group in a successful integration throughout that period. And the outcome we've achieved as a result of that, multiples paid for acquisitions have averaged less than four times as adjusted EBITDA. We've protected shareholder value, 
throughout periods of significant volatility, which has never been more evident in 2020 and 2021. And where, where, um, where relevant in future, we will continue to use performance related structures to ensure we maximize the outcomes from our acquisitions completed by the group. And now I'll pass to Mark to take us through the ESG performance. Uh, the divisional performance, we've been reporting segments for three years now, and that really starts to, to show how each division has got its own characteristics and they're built into an overall strategy that is very symbiotic. Um, really pleased that since 2019, we've delivered the um, compound annual growth rates that we have. Um, you'll know the 8% EBITDA growth rate, um, and that had a, that's had a COVID effect. So if you went back to 2019, we came to you all with a thesis that we would do these things and we would create a double digit EBITDA growth machine. If you normalized out 2020 from the COVID effect and just gave me the credit of staying um, flat 2019, this is a double digit EBITDA growth machine. Now, ESG, one of our most exciting verticals, and ultimately, um, we would not be uh, a leading authority on it if we didn't do the right things from an ESG perspective ourselves. So what I want to walk you through is um, how you can interpret our business from an ESG perspective. So this is our disclosure suite. You can find this all online. The um, TCFD and ESG will be updated to 2022 when we release our annual report. Um, and ultimately, when you look at businesses in your portfolio, if they are not doing this, they are not doing it correctly. Uh, ultimately, this is a direction of travel where what we see is a large amount of momentum for businesses to need to do these things, even if they're not actually required to from a compliance perspective, because ultimately all ESG disclosures require uh, amalgamation of the supply chain, which means that businesses who are not directly affected, it becomes revenue critical for them to keep their customers who are. So there should be a streamlined energy and carbon uh, reporting, a second report. Um, that does scope one and scope two emissions. There should be a carbon balance sheet. That does scope one, two, and three. And it's what allows a business to really show its progression to net zero year on year, how it's being achieved, how it's achieving carbon neutrality if it wants to, and ultimately the carbon cost of its operations. Some people will say, oh, I'm only going to report two or three categories of scope three because they're not material. For me, that, that, that really sits there and misses the point. All the categories can be done. It's not that hard. Businesses just need to organize the data and make the disclosure. TCFD sets out the um, risks and opportunities in relation to climate change. And it's important that business publishes both a disclosure and an index. What the index does is it effectively puts the points of the taxonomy and allows a, a, an analyst to look and find the right parts of the disclosure that address the point that's required from taxonomy. So doing those things, having both of them, is a really important way to get an effective ESG rating. If the companies in your portfolio aren't doing that, then they're not ultimately um, giving the information to the ratings agencies in a way they can utilize effectively. Finally, um, the ESG performance reports, we disclose to a GRI, a taxonomy, you could use SFDR, there's lots of them to use. The point being that when we do it, we can actually produce our report um, in a taxonomy and framework agnostic way. So it's in the eye of the beholder. Now, what, how this manifests itself in a level of professionalism is we often get um, inquiries in from our investors asking us to complete questionnaires. A lot of businesses, when they do this, they're putting down a two or three line answer that's pretty much made up the same day just to get the questionnaire off the desk. For us, we're able to actually point to the specific places in our disclosures that allow us to give the investor confidence that there's some robustness behind this process. Um, ultimately, you look at the marketplace here, you've got the, the big firms like Price Waterhouse, Deloitte, Grand Thornton, all operating in this space. And you've got ourselves who've really taken a different approach. And instead of being advisory down, we're data-driven bottom up. What that gives us increasing confidence of is that we have a market leading product at a market leading price point. And that's testament to the growth we're seeing and the demand for their services. So ultimately, we'd invite you to go and engage with our disclosure suite, 
look at it. And if you have any questions, clearly um, send them on to the team. The other thing we do is make sure that we consider ourselves the way the outside world sees us. So we've now deployed software, which um, a number of um, fund managers use to actually evaluate all of the companies in their fund. Uh, this is the Inspired page, this is how we look. Um, and ultimately we allow, the software allows um, the, the fund managers to show their um, ESG performance of all the companies at a fund level, at a holding level, and we also do the, the controversy um, monitoring for them. Uh, the key thing here for us is not that this is a, an amazing market. It's probably only a, a 20 million pound market in the UK. But what it's very good for is really starting to help us engage with the companies that are in those portfolios so we can help them improve the way they're perceived with the, by the world from an ESG perspective. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask David to walk you through the business value proposition, bring into life how we really now build and focus on client lifetime value so that having delivered um, a doubling of EBITDA over the last five years, we can organically do it over the next five years. Thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, our market, we've talked about some of these, but there are some really, really strong business drivers for this. High prices, extreme volatility, huge complexity, Indeed, for some customers, an increasing credit requirement to post collateral even before they can start procuring. These are some real strong business drivers for professional support. On the ESG side, we've already discussed how this is revenue critical. It's no longer reluctance compliance. It's about making sure your business can still sell and operate within your supply chain. It's investor critical. Investors more and more are looking for good ESG credentials to uh, direct their investments. It's legal and it's all about the whole business ethics. That results in the four needs. The help, need for help on cost, help to reduce consumption, help to reduce carbon, and help to make sure they're compliant. We think we've got the unique position to be able to help on all four elements of this. If we take the customer numbers now, on the assurance side, we have around 850 of the large clients, which are generating gross margin of around £20,000 per, per, per year on average. If we take a 10-year CLV, or client lifetime value, that gives us around £200,000 uh, CLV. The 1,600 smaller clients with 5K per annum, will give a CLV of £50,000 each. We also have some very small clients with a more modest contribution. We then have large ESG clients, on which we're dealing with 44 at the moment, that generate £40,000 per annum on average each, or £400,000 CLV. And 57 entry-level uh, ESG clients with around £8,000 per annum or £80,000 CLV. Then on top of that is the optimization. Now, it's almost impossible to try and put that into an annual value because it can fluctuate. But over the 10-year horizon, we can expect a large customer to deliver 2.5 million of CLV and a small optimization customer around 400,000 of CLV. Now, to put that in context, we'll talk in a moment about a very real example of where the CLV is far, far in excess of that 2.5 million, but more of that in a moment. If we actually look at the number of clients where, that are taking all three services from us in one year, last year, there were 12 large-scale clients with an average of 3.1 million CLV and 15 small clients with an average of 500,000 CLV. That's just active within the year. If we extrapolate that out across our entire customer base, then our opportunity is 3.6 billion CLV. Now, of course, we're not going to do that all at once, but let's just set the aspiration now to go from 12 in a year up to 25 in a year, 
Now, that might be some of the same 12. It might be that on that journey to 2027, that there'll be some customers come in and go out from our optimization perspective. But just active within that year, we're active with 25 large and 75 small, 100 total clients. We'd increase the gross margin by 73 million. And that's just been operational with 3% of our customer base at that one moment in time. So this surface area opportunity is immense. We move on to the ego wall. Some famous household names there that you'll understand <coughs> and you'll recognize. But let's bring this more to life with a real example. For those of you that uh, studied this last year, this is not the same retailer, it's a different retailer. Uh, High Street Retail, 500 stores. They've been a group client since 2010 and we deliver around 1.35 million of assurance services over the lifetime of the client. The average spend over those 13 years has been 1.7 million per year on repeatable projects. We've reduced their consumption by around 30%. Now that started in 2010 with LED, and that was a rollout across all stores, so that carried on for a number of years, we then moved on to controls installation. And again, that was a rollout uh, continuing over a number of years, dependent on their ability to deploy capital. Eventually, 2020, we come back around to upgrading the LED lighting. And the reason we're doing this is because of the need we are satisfying. The need we're satisfying is the desire to understand where to spend the next pound of capital to offset or remove that marginal unit of wasted excess consumption and therefore uh, carbon emission. So it creates this virtuous circle. When some have uh, referred to it like painting the fourth road bridge, where as soon as you think you're finished, you start again. So it's a repeatable demand that will continue on. That's attested to by the fact that there's a further 4.7 million pounds worth of projects in the pipeline, delivering a further 30% reduction on top of uh, that which we've discussed already. So the CLV to date, 23.7 million pounds. And that's not extrapolated, that's real. Those are real numbers. But let's take that to the opposite extreme. These are four disparate, disparate customers. The only thing they've got in common is they're taking EMAS, Energy Management as a Service, from them. Energy Management as a Service is a subscription-based model that's opening up optimization services to smaller clients. It's about that real granular understanding of what's happening on the site, where energy is being used, and more importantly, where it's being wasted, and then leading to the optimization projects to say, this is how you can reduce consumption. These are the projects that could come off the back of it. So EMAS in its own right is a driver to increase the lifetime value. But it's more importantly, an opening towards the uh, optimization type projects. Third and final example, a completely different one again this time, Make UK the manufacturing organization uh, we started with this in 2020 as a, a relatively small piece of educational work around how we can support uh, their members to control energy costs during COVID. Tw during 2021, we developed a, a net zero toolkit, mainly for small size manufacturers, just to help them understand some of the requirements and how to develop a plan to net zero, because they were, as we said, being asked by their supply chain, the questions that we've been referring to on the ESG section. So we help them with the toolkit just to start to understand where to go with that. We extended that latter half of 21 into a, a subsector roadmap to net zero help. Fast forward to 22, and we have now built up that trusted advisor status with the organization and indeed a number of the customers. We've onboarded 23 new logos and delivered 750,000 pounds worth of revenue across those customers 
with countless more opportunities uh, to go at on top of that as well. So again, example of a, a trusted advisor partnership and being able to sell one to many. Mark, I'll hand back to you to take us to the uh, 2023 and beyond. Thanks, David. So hopefully what you've been able to see is that um, not only have we done um, what we said we'd do all the way along, creating this double digit organic growth engine, but now by putting um, together a portfolio of a large number of clients with the opportunity to deliver significant growth in client lifetime value. You're looking at a factor of 10 times growth on that client list in terms of the value that can be generated over that 10 year life. And whereas some organizations might be using CLV to project an aspiration, we're demonstrating empirical CLV that we've already delivered multiple times. And we're in that process now of really accelerating the cross sell um, throughout the portfolio. So let's just look at um, where we get to for 2023 and how the year started. Um, ultimately, the new normal created by the energy crisis still has some potential to create a range of uncertainty in the assurance division. But increasingly, we're seeing that defence against the energy crisis um, macro theme emerge. And we believe that ultimately that translates into an opportunity. Um, we're focusing on increasing the lifetime value of those existing clients. Um, and ultimately, we've taken into the year the momentum to meet our market expectations. And those market expectations at the moment um, show that we're going to do that double digit um, EBITDA growth um, through in 2023. That's ultimately what the, the thesis says and how we started the year. Uh, and also, we're going to deliver that 80 to 90% cash conversion. Noting the great work that's been done in 2022, we expect that to continue into 2023. What we also want to do is make sure the market fully understands our aspirations. So between 2017 and 2022, we doubled EBITDA and went from being an assurance services business to a full service suite solution for the four C's. And those macro themes of ESG and net zero have really um, coincided well for us in that regard. We have a large portfolio of clients with very high retention rates that give us recurring revenues, which then allow us to have the opportunity through our C-suite relationships to really start to increase that client lifetime value. And ultimately, you can see our aspiration to double EBITDA over the next five years organically. That's achieved by focusing on client lifetime value, building on recurring revenues, building on repeatable demand, uh, from the optimization services, play into that strong ESG macro theme and play into that strong net zero macro theme. So the, if we bring that all together, um, in summary, strong results in 22 against a challenging backdrop, backdrop. Excellent opportunities from optimization services and ESG services. Our focus on client lifetime value and a five year aspiration to double EBITDA again thank you very much for your time any questions mark paul david thank you very much for your presentation ladies and gentlemen please do continue to meet your questions just by using the q a tab which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen but just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today i'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published q a can be accessed by your investor dashboard as you can see we received a number of questions throughout today's presentation and the first question reads as follows do you see the growth in optimization services as a sustainable trend or did it spike as, as a result of the energy crisis? Is that one, Dave? I will, yeah. Um, so do I see it as a sustainable uh, trend? Uh, absolutely. So there is no doubt that high energy prices made ROIs much more attractive and brought this right to the very, very top of the pile. Um, but actually the longer duration carbon net zero drive is here to stay and it's fundamental to the way in which businesses will operate so i think the the, the drive and the the um, pipeline for the optimization services is absolutely su sustainable and, and and growing and will continue to do so um, for for as long as we can we can see 
perfect. Thank you very much. The next question here asks, can you provide more colour on cost customer retention in assurance services as the announcement referred to increased customer churn? Dave, that? Yeah, I can take that one again. Yeah, OK. Um, it, it is true that when we looked at, or when we made the, the interims, we would normally have expected by that time of year a more significant part of our uh, customer base to have contracted. They hadn't. They were delaying decisions given where prices were. So we rightly flagged that there may be a, 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 a risk here. Actually, as it transpired, we've done significantly better than we perhaps thought might happen. Yes, there has been an increase in churn. I mentioned in the in the presentation, it, it's gone from a, an 85 plus percent retention rate down to around, around 80 percent. But that's more than offset by um, the uh, new business that's coming in, albeit there's a slight timing difference. Uh, of course, you would you would expect. But there's definitely that flight to quality of some of the big names coming into Inspired uh, and looking for the reassurance of dealing with a major player in the in the market. So churn has gone up, but there are mitigations for that. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's great. Just just moving on. Any comment on negative adjusted EBITDA for ESG services in FY22 and forward trajectory? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so you'll know that the we, we projected that that division this year at the start of the year would make a loss of circa a million pound of EBITDA. We revised that expectation at the half year stage um, because the, the division was performing at the higher end of our expectations. So we reduced it to 600 grand of, of loss in the period, having made that that decision to invest further, have improved concept in 2020 and 2021. And the division put formed in line with that upgraded expectation. In terms of looking forward, we're projecting that this division will will generate circa four million of revenue in 2023, and it will contribute about circa half a million pounds of EBITDA in the period. So starting to contribute to the group um, again, position in a way as per the same time last year, where you know hopefully there's some upside as, as the year progresses in that division, um, but we'll we'll guide prudently in the first instance and continue continue to execute in an effective way. Thank you very much, Paul. That's great. Um, the next one here, Mark, you've claimed it, so I'll direct it to you. How effective has cross-selling been between the different business lines? Yeah, so it's obviously a key part of the thesis and really what drives our um, client lifetime value analysis. Um, so if you look at the way the business was positioned, we put the various um, divisions in place over the 2018 through to 2022 period. Uh, in actual fact, they were in place 2020 but we lost 18 months due to COVID when you weren't allowed on client premises. So really that ability to drive that cross-selling thesis um, only really came to the fore um, in 2021. Uh, we're really pleased with how that's starting to work. Um, I think sometimes you get people thinking, well, they've got all these customers, why haven't they cross-sold more? Well, the point is we're only just starting that journey. So in 2021, we really proved that we can start to accelerate that. Uh, we pushed that forward in 2022 to pipelines, which are record levels. And ultimately, um, that's what really drives the momentum and confidence that says that we've got double digit EBIT gut DAR growth expected in 2023 and that ability to actually double EBIT DAR over all in um, over the next five years. So I think the um, reality for us is that the cross sell is working ahead of expectations but we're still at a relatively early stage. But whereas in 2021, I'd been talking about proving concepts, now we're just all about execution. Perfect, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, the next question here, what do you see as the biggest risk or challenge to achieving double digit EBITDA growth going forward? I guess I'll take that one as well as it's a, an overarching question. Um, I mean, clearly you've got to make sure that you're, you're delivering your service. So when you saw us um, invest in extra um, OPEX to help clients um, respond to the energy crisis. Uh, that's really a function of the fact that you, know, you have to be engaged with your clients and giving them the quality of service to earn the right to help them with those physical interventions that will reduce energy consumption and reduce carbon emissions. So um, making sure we, we keep right-sizing that and helping clients face any adversity that comes along, um, that's the, the key to success. Um, ultimately, if we were to sit there and see um, some other um, thing like a like a COVID event or a um, 
or an energy crisis, people start to say, I'm pretty unlucky as far as it goes at the moment. So we haven't had many clean years so far, but we're hoping to get a clean year where we can just execute the thesis and um, and let that growth come through. So for me, the pieces are on the board. Um, we've done all the, the the things we need to do to to execute this 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 increase in client lifetime value. And as I look forward at the moment, um, it would only be something out with our control that would um, would stop us doing that. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Is growth reliant on significant recruitment and are there any challenges in this area? So I don't think we have a, um, I suppose one of the things we have going through generally is that it's important investors understand that we prudently front run our recruitment to the growth that we have. So when you see increases in operating cost in a year, given we've got two high growth divisions in terms of um, optimization services in ESG, we're forever having to run our, our kind of labor cost um, six to nine months ahead of revenues. So that's where you start to see that, that, uh, that acceleration. So um, ultimately, we, we do recruit into those areas. Um, and we've also got a process now we reach a size and scale where we can really resource a, a lot of grow your own um, initiatives in that respect. Um, for optimization services, it's very much a case of um, bringing in the project managers and people with quality assurance, because ultimately we're not a man in van business. So we do the implementation through a contractor base um, and we then quality assure and make sure the, the, the installation is doing what it should be doing. From an ESG point of view, it's a really interesting um, challenge because there isn't a lot of experienced labor in the market. So you have some people who've been practitioners for, for many years and that's great, um, but they were very much ahead of the curve. You've got a number of professionals who are trying to retrain but maybe they haven't got the depth of knowledge that's required. Um, so ultimately what we do is bring in a blend. We've brought in some seasoned professionals and now we very much have a, a grow your own process. Um, but what's good about that from my perspective is it because we do a data driven bottom up solution um, that really allows um, that labor base that we're growing to deliver exceptional um, data led insights for the clients, which ultimately to be fair, and lead in our opinion to better disclosures. So labor growth acquired in both those areas um, and we effectively have created machinery to, to ensure that we can keep that labor running ahead of our expected growth in revenues. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, for shareholders, a key metric is earnings per share. When can we expect this to increase? Yep, it's a good question. So um, I guess from an earnings perspective, so in terms of adjusted PBT, we're expecting that we're going to deliver on average about 15, 16% growth year on year between 23 and 25. Clearly, we've touched on a lot around EBITDA growth and expected EBITDA growth. But from an adjusted PBT perspective, we're projecting now that we'll see a 15 to 16% growth. In terms of earnings, it is worthy of note that there will be a normalizing of um, the corporation tax impact in terms of effective rate. And also noting the, the, the increase as well in terms of corporation tax rates to 25% and that taking effect, which will impact earnings not growing at the rate that we're projecting adjusted PBT to grow. Um, but then once you get beyond 25, 26 and your tax position normalizes, um, you're in a position whereby you'll start to see comparable growth in both PBT and also EPS. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paul. And, and one final question here. How large could the software business grow? It still seems very modest. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the lovely thing about the software business is that, again, it was an acquisition we made in 2018 to give us our proprietary software. And then we started to invest significantly in it because energy has been such a technology laggard. Um, that platform that we've built, um, which is increasingly becoming market leading, um, as we've spoken about the 60 TPIs using it, really offers a um, exciting opportunity. In terms of growth in that area, um, for me, as we um, drop the additional modules in this year, that really consolidates it as a, as a, a platform solution. We estimate the marketplace overall for this is around about 100 million with another 100 million on top for ancillary services that can be um, set against it. Because a lot of companies that use the software would need white label for optimization services, for example, or for ESG. But um, in terms of that, that kind of market growth, 
it's really a, a thing from my perspective that I'd like to see us doing um, 20 to 30 percent um, annualized EBITDA growth in that area, noting that I, I guess I was excited by the vision a couple of years ago. We've had um, some some time where with the energy crisis in, in particular, people have perhaps spent less on technology than they would have in the energy space. Um, so we're hoping that that um, starts to flow through into 2023-24. Uh, um, and, you know, ultimately, once I've managed to deliver the modules for this year, I think that the proof will be in the eating thereafter. So as a business element, uh, we, we love the margins in it. We love the fact that it actually underpins our service anyway, so we have to do it. Um, and we really like the fact that it's uh, it's got the potential to become um, consolidated to that market leading platform. Perfect. Mark, Paul, David, thank you very much. I think you actually managed to address all those questions from investors. And of course, the company will review all the questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, Mark, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, so look, I mean, as a business, um, thank you to all of our staff and people who've really gone the extra mile during the energy crisis. Um, it's been exceptionally hard work and they've gone above and beyond, above and beyond the call of duty. I think um, as we look at a machine that's um, delivered um, double, we've doubled every dollar the last five years whilst transitioning into that full suite service provider, um, the great macro themes in which you operate and the actual pieces we have on the board now to organically double every dollar into the future, we're very excited about the business prospects and, and look forward to, to taking investors on that journey with us. Mark, Paul, David, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Inspired PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.